Welcome to worship here at Manchester United Methodist Church. Whether you're here in person or worshiping with us online, we are so glad that you've joined us. You are a beloved child of God and our community is better and more beautifully diverse because of your presence with us. If you are worshiping online, we encourage you to complete the online connection card linked in the video description so we know how to connect with you and also you can use the live chat to talk with one another and share your prayer requests. If you're here in person, you're invited to complete the card that's in your bulletin and place it in the offering plate to share any prayer requests that you may have. And we also invite you to stay with us after worship to join in socializing with your church family at our coffee hour. Now let's stand and greet one another this morning. Please join me in the call to worship. God, we come to worship and to be transformed by your spirit. Fill us to overflowing with your love. Stir compassion in us for all who suffer. 
Grant us the courage to continue in difficult seasons. Lead us in faithfulness and service. Please join in singing Have Thine Own Way, Lord, number 382 in the United Methodist Hymnal. The New Testament reading is from Romans 12, 9 through 18. Be sincere in your love for others. Hate everything that is evil and hold tight to everything that is good. Love each other as brothers and sisters and honor others more than you do yourself. Never give up. Eagerly follow the Holy Spirit and serve the Lord. Let your hope make you glad. Be patient in time of trouble and never stop praying. Take care of God's needy people and welcome strangers into your home. Ask God to bless everyone who mistreats you. Ask him to bless them and not to curse them. When others are happy, be happy with them. And when they are sad, be sad. Be friendly with everyone. Don't be proud and feel that you know more than others. Make friends with ordinary people. Don't mistreat someone who has mistreated you, but try to earn the respect of others and do your best to live at peace with everyone. This is the, New Test the Old Testament reading from Micah 6. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The word of God for the people of God.
Hey, good morning, church. You know, just as a, as a side note here, it's interesting because I had sent the message that I'm about to give to you to Dylan a couple weeks ago. And I think he picks out the hymns specifically to go with the message. It's, it, it's kind of interesting. But anyways, um, I have to say there's something very special about walking into the doors of this church. It seems like when I do, and maybe it's because I'm perhaps more focused on God or if I'm with my church family, it just seems different. It feels safer, and I'm more at peace than when I'm outside in the world and what's going on out there. I don't know if you feel that way, but I, but I do. Anyways, in... I'm thinking that most of you guys know LJ, my youngest grandson. I took this picture a couple of weeks ago. He was in our bathroom, and he had my Star Wars coffee cup and was pretending that he was shaving, uses Pam's, na Pam's nail file as a razor. There's still a little bit of shaving cream on him. You make me laugh, LJ. <laughs> Whenever we sit down to eat with him, there's always a sequence that we have to follow. First is a prayer. Then, he calls himself the dayer. And what that means is that he picks someone at the dinner table and says, how was your day? And that person has to tell everyone all the things that happened in their day. I mean, all the things. He then goes to the next person and says, how was your day? And so it goes until everyone has answered the question. And by the time it's all over, we're all starving and looking forward to eating what is hopefully still a hot meal. I will share with you that I am not, I am not looking forward to the next time that I share a meal with him. And the reason why is I have a problem. The problem is my morning routine. The first thing I do in the morning when I get up is I make coffee. Now I will admit, I love my coffee. I discovered this small coffee roaster called Whitmore Lake, up in Whitmore Lake called M36 Coffee. You can buy coffee there or you can get it up in, in their retail stores in Ann Arbor. Their coffee is nothing short of phenomenal. And I blend their roast with just the right amount of chicory beans I get, for, get from Cafe de Mont down in New Orleans. It's the perfect way to start my day. I pour it into my Star Wars cup, and although the mellow aroma of perfectly roasted coffee beans infused with the delectable taste of just the right amount of caramel macchiato awakens my taste buds to a beautiful day, I then turn on the news. And so starts the first of what will be many mistakes of the day. In today's 24-hour non-stop tsunami of news cycle reporting on all of the horrific things that are happening in our world, in our country, that is repeated over and over and over again, I really, really, really have a tough time dealing with all of the crap that goes on out there. Now, I'll be honest with you. I've truly struggled with how I go forward at this point of the message. Know that the words that I am about to share are going to be difficult for me to say. They will be difficult for you to hear. And I can understand that some of you may feel very uncomfortable with part of this message. But I'm asking that you hang in there with me because we will come to a point in the message that is all about the teachings of Jesus and us. And with that being said, Know that the words that I share with you are what I believe are truths that need to be spoken. And those truths are that our world, our country, is out of control. Division and hatred has spread like wildfire. What people are calling crimes against humanity and the atrocities of war around the world continue, resulting in the killing of innocents and refugees fleeing from their homes. It, it just seems unending. As President Zelensky said, the words never again ring hollow. We are witnesses to the continuous mass killings in this country on almost a weekly basis because of racial, ethnic, religious bigotry. School shootings, kids being killed in their schools. The words, we're sorry for your loss, ring hollow. Sexual abuse of women and children. Just a few weeks ago, it was reported that a 10-year-old girl 
in Ohio was raped and is now pregnant and having to deal with that. I have a type of, I have some words for the type of person that raped that child, but I can't use it in church. There are political and legal attacks on both minorities and the LGBTQ community. Abject poverty and homelessness are allowed to exist around the world. Here's a question for you. What emotions do the following words elicit in you? Rob Elementary, Columbine, Virginia Tech, Sandy Hook, and Oxford High School right here in Detroit. What about Highland Park, Illinois, Buffalo, New York, Putin in the war in Ukraine, Iraq, Afghanistan, January 6th insurrection, Ahmaud Aubrey, George Floyd. What about Dr. Larry Nasser, Jeffrey Epstein, Harvey Weinstein, and R. Kelly? The list of all of the horrific things that people do to each other goes on and on and on. You know it. You hear it every day. And I have no problem pointing out where north, south, east, and west are, but I'd really hate to point out where the path to which the moral compass of our nation, of our world, is pointing towards. If you think about the world that we are living in, I would say that instead of living in a time of joy, and peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, we're actually living in a time of sadness, intolerance, hatred, cruelty, disloyalty, instability, and madness. Now, I'm not saying that's everywhere and with everyone, but it certainly dominates much of our society. Personally, I'm not frustrated, I am not angry, I am enraged at the type of world that we live in. I ask myself, where the heck is Jesus? Where the heck is God in all of this? God is this loving God, right? And I don't understand why it is that he just doesn't put an end to the madness. How is it that he can allow all of the hurt, all of the pain to go on day after day? Do any of you ever think that way? Do you ever even question just a little, where is God in all of this? Or is it just me? I've heard a lot of justifications for the way the world is. Eve eating the apple, Satan having dominion over the earth. We still need to go through the end times, as written in Revelations. Mostly what I hear is the free will argument. Guess what words are not in Scripture? Free will. Guess what words are in Scripture? Thou shall not kill. You know what other words are in, this, in Scripture? Is he said them this morning. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Mic drop. If Jesus, and I, if Jesus and I were just hanging out together, having a burger and a beer, I would say to him, Lord, I just don't get it. I don't know if it was Eve or Satan or the end times or free will, but I think you let those justifications go way too far. You let people get out of control. If it were up to me, I would say that people can have all the free will that they can handle. They can follow whatever career they choose, to live where they choose, to marry where they choose. They can choose Michigan State over U of M. Well, maybe not that far. But we shouldn't have the choice to kill other people, to kill kids in their schools, to sexually abuse women and children. As a parent, I tried to guide my kids on the decisions that they made, but I allowed them to decide, but I but I allowed them to decide what it was that they wanted in their life. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't let them ride in a car without seatbelts, across the street without, without looking. In my opinion, God should not allow the choices we make to end up hurting other people in such truly horrific ways. But I'm not God, and I don't understand why he allows those things to happen. I truly struggle with the world and ask myself, where the heck is Jesus? Where the heck is God? I believe the truth is that we live in a world where people bend to the ways of the world rather than making the world bend to the teachings of God. Perhaps someday it will be different. You're about to hear a song written and performed by John Crispin 
and Greg Suha entitled Someday. The lyrics, incredibly profound. It, it, it's just an amazing, amazing song. Jody? Someday the blind will see. Someday the dead will hear. Someday the lame will walk, and someday the sign will talk. Someday I believe. Someday. Someday we'll bless those that mourn. Comfort the lost and forlorn. Someday the sun will rise and dry the tears from sorrow dies. Someday I believe. Someday. Someday the last shall be first Holy waters will flow to those that thirst Broken hearts will be made whole They'll be a bond to heal the soul Someday I believe Someday I believe Someday I believe Perhaps someday, if we all truly followed the teachings of God, of Jesus, and what his disciples taught, we'd be living in a different world. What do you think? If you do think that following the teachings of Jesus is something we should be doing, be doing here's a question for you. Do the teachings of Jesus fill you? Do they guide you as you take your next steps in your life? Do they guide you in the way you act towards others? You think of Jesus not only as the Son of God, but as you read or hear the words that he shared with us, you think of him as your teacher. Jesus has a great teaching in the story of the Good Samaritan that if everyone followed it, I believe that we would have a very different world to live in. You know the story, right? Scripture says a legal expert, basically a lawyer, asked Jesus what he has to do to inherit eternal life. Inherit eternal life. Interesting word, inherit. Sounds like something a probate lawyer would use. Personally, I don't think we inherit life eternal. I would say it's a gift of grace from God. Anyways, Jesus says to receive eternal life, you got to do two things, and it's just five simple words. Love God, love your neighbor. Then the lawyer asks another question, because that's what lawyers do, right? He asks, who is my neighbor? Let's stop here for a minute. The guy's a lawyer. Let's assume that he graduated from the Jerusalem School of Law, but he doesn't know who his neighbor is? If he didn't learn the definition of neighbor in his first year of probate law classes, he certainly should have learned it from his parents. I think he was just being a jerk. But Jesus is way too savvy, way too savvy to answer the question the way the lawyer was trying to set him up to answer it. Jesus, being the teacher that he is, takes the opportunity to teach through the telling of a story. Basically goes like this. This guy's walking down the street, minding his own business. He gets mugged, beaten within an inch of his life, left for dead on the side of the street. Then a priest walks by and sees him, but he doesn't go to help him. Instead, he crosses the street, doesn't want to get involved. Let's step again for a moment. Imagine you, you're walking down the street, you see this guy close to death on the sidewalk. How absolutely horrible of a person would you have to be to ignore him? How completely lacking in any degree of caring, concern, compassion for another person do you have to be to cross the street and walk away? I have a word for that type of person, but can't use it in church. 
Anyways, Jesus continues. Then a Levite walks by. Now the Levite served in the synagogue along with the priests, responsible for, responsible for many religious ceremonies and rituals. So the Levite thought, nah, I ain't getting involved either. Maybe it was because he was walking with the priest and didn't want to make his boss look bad. And just as an FYI, according to Jewish tradition at the time, the priest and the Levite would have been deemed spiritually unclean if they would have touched an unclean person prior to, go, prior to going to the temple. So perhaps Jesus is saying that maybe the priest and the Levite were people of God in name only, not people of God based on how they actually lived their lives, not people of God based on the teachings of Scripture, not people of God who treat others with love and caring. They both put political, I'm sorry, they both put religious tradition over compassion, compassion for one's neighbor. Then a Samaritan walks by. Now the Samaritans were Jews who lived in Samaria, basically northern Israel, but they were really, really, really hated because of differences in political, ethnic, and religious beliefs from the Jewish people in southern Israel. And I gotta say, thank goodness that the world has changed and people don't hate each other anymore because of religious, political, or ethnic differences. Anyway, it was the Samaritan who helped the man. The Samaritan who took the, Samaritan who took the man to the inn and gave the innkeeper money so the man can be looked after. Or maybe Dr. Martin Luther King in a, ser in a sermon he had given on Jesus' teaching on the, on the Good Samaritan, hit the nail on the head. Here's what Dr. King said, and I quote, It's possible that the priest and the Levite looked over at the man on the ground and wondered if the muggers were still around. Or it's possible that they felt that the man on the ground was merely laying there and faking, and he was acting like he had been robbed and hurt in order to lure the priest and the Levite to come closer so he could rob them. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop, this, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan comes by and he reverses the question. He thought, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? What will happen to him? So let's take Dr. King's teachings and apply it to ourselves today. The question is not, if we stop to help the homeless person, will we have to take him to the homeless shelter, give him some money, or even take him to McDonald's and buy him a meal? It's not if we help the elderly widow next door cut her lawn, help her with her groceries, whatever it might be. Will we be late for where we're going? The question is not, if we stop to help the person in need, what will happen to us? The question is, as Dr. King put it, if we do not stop to help the person in need, what will happen to them? Maybe scripture does have a few things to teach us. What do you think? That being said, the question I would pose to you is, do you believe the peoples of the world are truly open to the teachings of God? So much of the reality of our world that we live in today is so opposite of what Christ teaches, so far afield of how God wants us to live our lives. We talk a lot about living in the world that ought to be rather than living in the world that is. Well, I'm talking about that today because the world, because the world is what it is, because of the enormous influence it has on us, I will admit that it's easier to say that we follow the teachings of Jesus than to actually do so, kind of like the priest and the Levite. So how do we persevere? How do we push back against all of the horrific things, all of the stuff that's out there that we face every day, all of the hatred, all of the injustice? Here's one possible way. And if you take anything away from what I'm sharing with you today, take this. You need to make a conscious decision. I need to make a conscious decision. The conscious decision we need to make is whether we choose to have a personal relationship with Christ and follow his teachings or not. 
Do we want to be strengthened by his teachings so we can persevere against the tragedy that exists in the world? Because being strengthened by his teachings, we're going to be able to make it through the next day. We can persevere no matter what the world throws at us. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to be fed up with all of the crap that's out there. But it does mean, what it does mean is that following what Christ teaches us helps us through the difficulties, the trials in our life. Just remember this. Making a decision to follow Jesus' teachings, it only takes a moment. Living that decision, living that decision takes a lifetime. And I would say that in order to do that, we need to keep the relationship with God and with Jesus the priority, the priority in our lives. Our personal relationship with God should be at the center of who we are. And if you think about relationships, here's a, here's a truth. Relationships ain't easy. Don't believe me? Just ask any marriage counselor. As in any relationship, I admit that my relationship with Christ has not always been a healthy one. Not always healthy because of my attitude, my perspective, my stubbornness. There have been some really hard conversations, direct conversations that I've had with Jesus. Questions that I have about why things are the way they are. And I have never come up with an answer that I can understand or accept. But through all of the difficult times that I don't understand in my life, questions that I have that go unanswered, Jesus keeps showing up. He has been there to support me wherever I am on my life's journey, on my faith journey. The important point is there continues to be a personal relationship. And when you make your relationship with God a priority, when you choose to continue to live as Jesus teaches and you live the life that Christ sets out for you, and you face the obstacles that life puts in front of you, you can be the one who loves God and loves your neighbor. You can be the Good Samaritan. But as I said, to live that life is not an easy thing to do. And I got to tell you, there have been times that it's been hard for me to do. So I am the type of person who will bend over backwards for someone I know. I will freely admit that there have been times when towards a stranger, I've been judgmental, overly cautious, not wanting to make the extra effort to help the person in need. There have been times that I have been the priest and the Levite. And if I, were truly be, if I were truly to be truthful with you, it's because there are times that I follow the teachings of the world rather than that of Jesus. The truth is, sometimes I miss the mark when it comes, when it comes to living my life the way that God wants me to. And why? Because I let the realities of the world invade my mind, affect my decisions. And my spirit is so weighted down when that happens. Has that ever happened to you? Or is it just me? What do you think? Well, what I do know is I keep trying. I get up every morning and I try again to be the type of person that Christ wants me to be. Trying to live in this world that is so opposite of what Christ teaches. Trying to be the Good Samaritan trying to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with my God. And listening to the words of love and caring that are shared here at our church helps me through my days. And also to drink my coffee with the mellow aroma of perfectly roasted coffee beans infused with the delectable taste of caramel macchiato that awakens my taste buds to a beautiful new day. And as I am here before you, i got to tell you, I still don't understand why it is that God allows all of the horrific things to happen. Till the day I die, I'll never understand it. Maybe I'm not supposed to understand. People with much greater insight than I have been trying to make sense of this world for thousands of years and have fallen flat. So maybe that's not what I'm supposed to do. Maybe what I'm supposed to do is as simple as five words. Love God, love my neighbor. And so with all of the horrific things that are happening in this world, as hard as it has been for me, as much as I struggle with everything that's out there, I'm here before you, and I am humbled and blessed to be able to share this message with you.
And after this service is over, we're going to go back to our regular daily lives, living in a world that has not changed. But hopefully we all have, maybe even just a little, and will continue to change. Hopefully we will all gain greater insight into the way that God wants us to live our lives to hopefully make a difference in someone else's life. Hopefully we will make the conscious decision to act as best we can to live our lives based on Christ's teachings, where we are committed to developing an ever-deepening and loving relationship with our God, being obedient to his teachings, and reflecting, reflecting those teachings to the people around us. Hopefully as Christ continues to come alive within us and we walk on life's journey, we will reflect him. Our actions towards others are such that we reflect him. Maybe that's all we're supposed to do. Earlier I talked about a question, I, I asked the question, where the heck is Jesus? Where the heck is God? I'm going to take a lesson from Dr. King and switch that question around. The question is not where the heck is Jesus. The question is, where the heck are we? God has provided for us. He gave us Jesus to be our teacher and our guide. He gave us the words in Scripture to help guide us, direct us, to show us how to live. God also gave us one of the most powerful forces in the universe, the power to choose. Each one of us has the power to choose how we live our lives, what decisions we make, and how we interact with others. We can choose peace instead of war. We can choose love instead of hatred. We can choose to be kind instead of being angry. We can choose to share the knowledge and wealth that we have with all of the peoples of the planet and eliminate hunger and poverty as opposed to wasting our resources on military budgets, on national or personal gain. The world simply chooses not to, and the results are what you see. What choice do you think Jesus would have us choose? Here's another truth. You, me, we're not going to change this world. Ain't going to happen. I can't make Pam change. I can't make my kids change. I can't make my grandkids change. I certainly can't make my next door neighbor change. He's an Ohio State fan. The only person that I can make change, the only person that I can make change is me. And the only person that you can make change is you. And as we look at ourselves, is there not some aspect of who we are that we can change so we can be more of a reflection of Jesus' teachings? What do you think? Earlier I talked about a conscious decision that you need to make, I need to make. Well, it's decision time, church. We have the power to choose what type of people we will be and how we're going to live our lives. Will we live our lives the way that Christ teaches? Will we, be, will we be the good Samaritans? Will we strive to have a relationship with God and others that God puts on our path? Make a decision. You can either live your life the way that you yield to the Spirit of God or not. As in all relationships, you're only going to get what you put, up, what you put into it. Christ put everything he had into his relationship with us. What will you do in return? The relationship with God has been fully offered to you and me, and it's up to us to choose to receive it and live it. So I ask you, I ask each one of you, what do you intend to do? Thank you, Mitch. Each time we gather, we also consider how we might come together as a congregation to share God's love every way that we can. Together, our faithful generosity supports all the mission and ministry of this church. Gifts of all types can be put in the offering plate or can be made online through our website. There's no obligation or expectation, simply the invitation to consider how God might be inviting you to support the work of our church. I now invite our usher forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. God, you know our hearts and our efforts to live in your love. Give us the strength to choose your ways and reach out in kindness to the stranger. Give us the courage to become more generous in every part of our daily living. We pray this in your holy name, amen. We have a few prayers to share from our community today. Uh, we have a prayer request uh, to please pray for Kathy and John, and also uh, Gladys Uphouse will be turning 93 this Friday, and she would so love to receive birthday cards. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life, for the gift of your son, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lead us through the trials that we encounter, through suffering and sorrow, challenges and struggles, through tired times and dark places. Be with those who weep or cannot sleep, those who have no peace, those who seek release. Lead us with grace, love, and peace. Fill us with hope, patience, and courage. Transform us in your image. Transform us to grow, to understand, and to serve. Transform us that we can be made whole in love. And in wholeness, may we be the hands and heart of Christ, in whose name we pray as we now pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in singing, I'm going to live so God can use me, which we can find in the Faith We Sing hymnal. It's number 2153. My dear church family, I leave you with this. May you choose to follow the teachings of God where you do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with him. 
May you choose to follow the teachings of Jesus where you love God and you love your neighbor. May you choose to be the good Samaritan where you go out and love and care for and help the needy. And may you choose to live your life in a more loving, caring, and closer relationship with God, with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Have a blessed week.